This is the city of Bath, Maine, and I'm looking at Old South Place. It's the only indication that remains of the Old South Church, which until July 6th, 1854, was in this very place. On that day, uh, a large band of people associated with the Know Nothing movement in the United States set fire to that Catholic Church. It was uh, a center that represented Catholicism, which was a different religion, but it also represented a community place for newcomers, newcomers who were economically competing with those who had lived in Bath, Maine before. And those down the hill in that direction were working at Bath Iron Works. They were Irish immigrants. The anti-Irish sentiment at the time uh, led to such a fervor that the church no longer exists, burned to the ground, a symbol of strong social re rejection. Quick, pull out a piece of paper and make a few guesses. What percentage of Americans would you say are African American, American Indian or Native American, Asian, Hispanic, Latino, other, Pacific Islanders, white, and not Hispanic? Pause the video, write down your guesses about these percentages, and then press play again when you're ready to take a look at some quote-unquote actual answers. I say quote-unquote as a sense of irony because although these are the actual uh, quote-unquote results from the United States Census Bureau, there are some curiosities among them. But before we look at those curiosities, let's think about your guesses. Compare them to these figures from the U.S. Census Bureau in which people are asked to self-report their racial categories. So people get a chance to choose what race they feel they belong to. If you are like most people who make guesses, you have underestimated the percentage of people who report themselves to be white and have overestimated the percentage of people who say they're from other racial categories. Uh, apparently, the presence of other races is more evocative, is more noticed by people when they look around them and try to think about what share of people fit into each racial category. But step back now and think about what's noticeable, what's notable about this list of races. These titles, they're very curious if you think about them. First of all, not all national possibilities are represented, although there clearly are some nations here. We have um, Hawaiian, which is a former nation, and those who were native to Hawaii when it was a nation are native Hawaiian. We have the category of Hispanic, which refers to uh, Hispaniola. Then there are geographies, the idea of African American, on the other hand, there's Asian, which is a category. In a very literal sense, nobody who is an American is an Asian unless they have a dual nationality because they're in the continent of uh, America. And yet it seems that the geographic identity of Asian sticks with someone even if they are not living in Asia. Furthermore, there are parts of the planet where there are many people that are not included here. Uh, there are no people from the Indian subcontinent. There's no uh, place for these people to go. Australians? Well, are Australians Asian? What about Middle Easterners? Uh, what about Africans? Uh, African Americans and Africans are not the same. Russians are not typically considered Asians which is curious uh, from an American point of view, but there's no place for a Russian to go. Are Russians white? Right, that's another curiosity, is that we have a mixing. We have a mixing of colors. We have a mixing of nations. We have a mixing of supposed geography, but certain people that we would not include in those geographies. 
And then we have many nationalities grouped together. Hispanic can refer to individuals from across many, many, many tens of thousands of miles of distance away from one another. Uh, Hispaniola originally refers to uh, the uh, uh, nations of Portugal and Spain, uh, and yet in Central and Southern America, there are a huge number of countries from which somebody could come. Uh, the idea of American Indian is itself a melange. There are many nations that uh, we now just simply call American Indian. Uh, Asia is an incredibly diverse place. And the whole notion of white is, is a curiosity. Uh, by white, we seem to sometimes mean European, but sometimes we don't. Sometimes we mean other things. What do we mean? This is not, in short, a systematic list. It's not a list that makes any kind of logical sense if we are going to build a list from the ground up, from the beginning, just conceptually. And yet, uh, here the list is. Why? Why is this list here? Why are there certain categories here, and why are there not other categories? Well, that's because if you follow the argument of Michael Omi and Howard Winant in their book, Racial Formation in the United States, race is not a biological reality, but rather a concept. It, it signifies and it symbolizes social conflicts and interests by referring to different types of human bodies. Let's unpack that statement. Race is an idea. Uh, it, it signifies something. It creates a sign. And it, what does it symbolize? What does it signify? It signifies a history of social conflict. So if you think about the notion of Hispanic or Latino, uh, what is the context in which the United States of America uh, which has the Census Bureau creating these racial categories. What, 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 what's the, the history of interaction? One of uh, immigration, certainly, but one of also shifting borders. Uh, one of many border wars uh, and Spanish-American wars, which uh, occurred across wide swaths of the globe. Uh, economic competition and linguistic differences, linguistic conflicts. What about the racial category African-American? Well, you have a history of slavery. What is slavery but a long period of social conflict in which people are competing against one another and ultimately using one another as tools? Why do we have a racial category of Asian? We have a significant period of uh, Asian immigration, which begins hundreds of years ago, but uh, occurs mainly in the 19th, 20th, and 21st century uh, in a situation where Asian workers are at first imported, uh, given the label coolies, uh, as uh, uh, human trafficked workers uh, that then compete with other workers in the American West who are already there. Uh, we have a history of conflict with Asia in the 20th century that followed the 19th century. And so we have a racial category of Asian. It is one that we recognize, although when we think about it, we usually think of East Asia and Southeast Asia, which are two areas with which we have had extended conflict. American Indians and Alaska Natives were there before European settlers. Uh, ever came to the land. The same can be said for native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders. And then there's white. What does white refer to? What is the social conflict of whites? What could be seen as the victor in these conflicts? So this color wheel that you see here, this list of quote-unquote races, is thought about 
in terms of different kinds of human bodies, that we have different biologies, that we have different racial groups. But really, it's all about our history as a nation. Uh, histories of groups of people coming in and conflicts which ensue. And that's why we have some races here and we don't have other races here. We don't have a significant history of conflict with the Indian subcontinent. We don't have a significant history of conflict with Australia. Omi and Wynant think about the idea of the formation of racial categories through racialization being a tool used in intercultural conflict when two cultures come into contact with one another. Uh, the idea of racialization, it's, it's one way to manage that conflict. Omi and Wynant say, we define racial formation, quote, as the socio-historical process by which racial categories are created, then they're inhabited, then they're changed, and sometimes they're destroyed. Racial formation is a process of historically situated projects in which human bodies and social structures are represented and organized. That last um, sentence means that what we think of people's bodies, what we think of as this innate thing called race, is really a reflection of the social structure of conflict between groups. And if racial formation is this broader process through which racial categories can be created, they can be changed, they can be destroyed, the creation of a, a, a racial category is called racialization. And this is discussed if you're a student of mine in, in your textbook. Racialization is the uh, formation of a new racial identity regarding a group of people that haven't been considered a race before. Here's an example of racialization that you might not have been thinking of. World War I, uh, a significant conflict, a war in which many people are dying, uh, many Americans are dying, a uh, brutal war. How do you keep this thing going? You have to racialize. Uh, and racialization means that you have to show that bodies of one sort of person are different than bodies of another sort of person. And look at this. You have in this uh, propaganda poster created for the U.S. Army by H.R. Hops in 1917, you have, a, 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 you couldn't come up with a clearer example of this. You have the idea of a, a, a woman here. Um, she's the cultural image of Columbia, a representation of the United States. And then you have the mad German. He's a brute. He's an ape. He's hairy. He wears no clothes. He has the, the German mustache and the German war helmet on, but he doesn't have a human recognized face. He's got fangs. The, the fangs are dripping uh, with, with, with slobber and this gigantic tongue. And stepping onto your shores, stepping onto American shores, it's an invasion, an invasion of a subhuman. This is a poster that dehumanizes, that creates a racial other so that a conflict can be managed. It's easier to engage in war against a non-human other, against a race that is incredibly different from your own. Here's another example of racialization. This is another propaganda poster for the United States created for the United States government in 1942 by Jack Campbell for the U.S. War Production Board. And it is a, a, a propaganda poster that is created for uh, American workers. Uh, and the idea is that if you wash up early and you rush out the door, then they're going to win the war. I won't even use the racial term here, right? You can't simply say... Uh, give the Japanese person time to win the war, they're shortened, right? The nationality is shortened into something else. What is that something else? It's something else that does not have human ears, does not have human teeth. And again, there's this, this slobber, this drool that's coming out that is what? Animal-like. Uh, you have claws instead of hands, right? 
and uh, strangely shaped head. This is not a normal human, says the image. It is easier to engage in war against individuals that are not perceived to be human. Uh, the eyes are not the same. Uh, very little is the same. This is racialization. If you want to engage in a conflict, you want to manage the conflict, uh, you have to racialize in order to do it. Well, racial formation is not simply racialization, the creation of racial categories, but it is also the des destruction of racial categories. When conflicts go away, when they subside, past racial connotations that have been present no longer need be present. So we could think about uh, Italians. We could think about Polish. If you're above a certain age, you may remember the waning years of the Polak joke, right? Uh, the idea of a Polak being somebody who is has a certain number of characteristics uh, and, and they're stereotypical characteristics. That they're all negative, and they're referring to what? A period in time when uh, Polish or Italian or Irish were doing what? They were immigrating into the United States uh, from places in Europe where past waves of American immigrants had not come. So what they have in common is a distinction from a previous wave of immigrants. Who are those? You may have heard of the racial categorization of the WASP, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. The Irish, the Italian, the Polish are not Anglo-Saxons, eth ethnically speaking. They come from different parts of Europe. They're not Ps, they're not Protestants. They're Catholics, they have a different religion, they have a different belief system. Now, does a different belief system make you have a different race? Well, no, not literally, but race is not about literal bodily differences. We come to believe they are, but they're really about cultural conflicts. And so, in a past racial connotation, for many people in the United States, uh, through the middle of the 20th century, the Irish, the Italian, the Polish would not be considered within the realm of white. And then there's a period in which these individuals might be called white ethnics, meaning that they're not quite what we mean by white. And then very slowly over time, uh, Irish, Italian, and Polish have become assimilated in. Why? Because the period of economic conflict through significant immigration has passed, long passed. And so a racial formation uh, can include the destruction of racial categories. Now, if you think I'm being a little overblown in saying perhaps that, let's say, the Irish have a racial categorization associated with them, or used to, I just want you to take a look at a few images here. This is an image, uh, for, not from uh, uh, some backward book, but an image that was quoted from a book and was placed in Harper's Weekly, which was seen as the one of the cultural standard bearers for many, many years in the United States. And it, it's hard to see from the uh, original uh, image here uh, what the text is, but I'll read it to you. It, 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 it compares an Irish, Iberian, an Anglo-Teutonic, and a Negro. These are three racializations here. And you see them in profile to show how they are different. And yet, this is really about the Irish Iberian, quote unquote. This is someone who represents a middle racialized form, okay? And the argument goes here that, quote, the Iberians are believed to have been originally an African race, who thousands of years ago spread themselves throughout Spain over Western Europe. Their remains are found in the barrows or burying places in sundry parts of these countries. The skulls are of the low prognathus type. They came to Ireland and mixed with the natives of the South and West, who themselves 
are supposed to have been of low type and descendants of the savages of the Stone Age, who in consequence of isolation from the rest of the world had never been outcompeted in the healthy struggle of life and thus made way according to the laws of nature for superior races. So this is an argument that is, first of all, starting uh, with a previous racialization, which is one of the Anglo-Teutonic versus the Negro. And it is supposing that one is higher than another. That's a stratification system. And then it is racializing the Irish by making up a story. And it's, a, it's quite a story. It's basically saying uh, your typical Irish person is a, a combination of a quote-unquote Negro and a caveman. Uh, and is therefore, what? Not fully Anglo-Teutonic, of course. One of the, quote-unquote, lower races. Not fully to be accepted. Not fully to be integrated. Let's take a look at another image of the racialization of the Irish. That was from 1899. This is from 1871. So you'll see a picture, a picture here on the left, Columbia again, which is a, an image, a representation of good American value in the 1800s. She's putting a stranglehold on an Irish person. This is uh, Thomas Nast, who in many ways started out uh, political cartooning. But look at that face. Compare the face of Columbia to the Irish person. Uh, he's got a nose that doesn't look exactly right. He's got whiskers. He doesn't have proper teeth. He has fangs. Uh, he has a different sort of hair, a bristly hair. This is not the same sort of person as Columbia, as you can see. He has shading to his face. While Columbia is pale, the Irishman is dark, swarthy, you might say, to use a word from the 1800s. Uh, he's got long, claw-like fingers. And furthermore, if you look at his body, he has something that sort of is sticking out behind him, almost like a tail. Certainly not of the same race, according to this image and in some ways animalistic. A brutal kind of face that looks almost like a snout, not fully human. Why are the Irish uh, being picked on? The Irish are immigrants, the Irish are newcomers, the Irish are competing with those who consider themselves to be the standard bearers of the time for what an American is. If you recall from the beginning of this video, this is not uh, restricted to areas outside of Maine. An entire church was burned to the ground. Why? Because of an influx of Irish immigrants working at Bath Ironworks in the mid-1800s, creating a conflict, a competition, which is racialized so that there are others who are not to be accepted, who are not to be tolerated, who are not to be allowed in the state of Maine as real Mainers. And if they need to be run out on a rail, if they need their church to be burned to the ground, well, so be it. As it turns out, the phrase run on a rail uh, is apt. Uh, this is not limited to Bath, Maine. In Ellsworth, Maine, also in the 1800s, a very famous Catholic figure, John Bapst, uh, before he, he founded a number of institutions, was trying to build up Catholic support in the area of Ellsworth. And while in Ellsworth, for his Catholic religious activities, which were associated with otherness and a racialized sense of the time, he was tarred, hot tar, and then feathered and he was put on a rail and run on a rail out of town. He was essentially tortured. And that was what one did to Catholics at the time. That was racialization. And it's changed now, and we forget this, 
kind of racialization, this othering of people who were also from the continent of Europe, uh, simply because time has passed, generations have passed, and phrases like Irish need not apply uh, no longer appear. But if we think about these racializations now, we can consider how the way we think about race now might not be constant, might be subject to change, and we might think about the historical forces behind them. If we had past racial connotations like Irish, Italian, and Polish, before the year 2001, we didn't really have significant racial connotations for two other labels, Arab and Muslim. Now you'll notice one of these we might refer to as uh, an ethnic connotation coming from the peninsula of Arabia or a nearby lands. One of them is religious. How can a religion be racial, you might say? That's not about physical bodily differences, and that's entirely the point. You can racialize anything. Uh, if you associate it with bodily differences, if you associate it uh, with a, a group with which you're in competition and which you reject, uh, in a sense, we can predict that it will be racialized. Now, how can we see that racialization? We can see it through rejection of a group. And there's a, a really interesting tool called the Bogardus Social Distance Scale. It was developed and named for sociologist Emery Bogardus, who, who developed it in 1926. And it's been used ever since 1926. And the nice thing about this scale is that it's been used over and over and over again. Uh, and you can substitute in and out all these different supposed racial categorizations. And you can um, compare how people uh, are ranked uh, from different uh, named groups uh, in one year to another, from one place to another. The tool always asks the following. For each of the groups listed below, please indicate on a scale of one to seven how much closeness you would find to be acceptable between you and members of that group. That is, how close would you allow people to get before you would say, no, that's just too close. Would you allow them to be close relatives by marriage? That's about as close as you can get. Would you let them be number two, your close personal friends? Number three, well, maybe not your close personal friends, but would you let them be neighbors on the same street? Well, maybe not neighbors, number three, but maybe number four. How about just as co-workers? Would you tolerate them not really as co-workers, but just as citizens? Well, maybe they shouldn't be citizens, but number six, only as visitors to your country? Or what about number seven? Would you exclude them altogether from your country? So, the higher the number is, the greater the rejection of the group by the person who is filling out the survey. Now, this is not hypothetical. We can see, shortly after the 2001 attacks, uh, Bogartis Social Distance Scale survey results for the United States, a representative sample of the United States. And so what do you see in, in the top 10 results over on the left and the bottom 10 results over on the right? The top 10 have the lowest scores. They're closest on average to one. Uh, and that indicates more acceptance. What are these groups? Whites, Italians, Canadians, British, Irish. The Irish have been accepted. French, Greeks, Germans. African Americans and Dutch, with one exception, African Americans, uh, you have individuals who are of white skin or light skin, pale brown skin to be more accurate. And if you include African Americans within the notion of what it is to be an American, then you have groups that are either uh, of European extraction, or European, or in the North American continent. What's on the right? Everything else. People who are not either descended from, or living in, or emigrating, emigrating from uh, a European or North American place. South of the border, east and south of Europe. 
These are the individuals who are rejected. And who's rejected most of all? Who's racialized most of all? Arabs, Muslims. Why? What happened in 2001? A conflict. A huge conflict. A conflict that has changed our culture. And that has happened by uh, taking an act which involved 20 people and generalizing it to Muslims and Arabs as groups of people of which together there are billions on the planet. Let's take that forward to this semester in which I have surveyed three classes at the University of Maine at Augusta and asked for averages. The 10 lowest distances have very clear characteristics. With the exception of American Indian or Native American, we have groups that would unequivocally be agreed upon by most passers-by to be included as subparts of what it means to be white. Although that didn't always used to be the case. Remember, Italian and Irish used to not be considered within the mainstream of the white race. In fact, the Irish used to be very strongly racialized in America, but no longer well accepted. And the American Indian is certainly perceived to be part of the American racial palette, where race is this social construction. What's on the right? The 10 highest distances? These averages? It's the same group, with one exception. Uh, individuals who are representing south of the border, if we're talking about Haitian, or south of Europe and east of Europe groups in terms of where they come from. What are the lowest groups in terms of their ranking? What are the highest distances that people want to place between themselves and others in this semester's classes? Arab and Muslim. An interesting addition that I made, which was not on the 2001 survey, is the religion of uh, Mormonism or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, they're referred to as the Mormons uh, because it's shorter. And if you, you can say so, uh, a name that's shorter, it's easier to categorize and to think of that group as an other. This is a religious group that is thought of very clearly as an other with which people are very uh, uncomfortable. Uh, which is interesting because the Mormon tradition is also an American tradition. So that's interesting. Um, but otherwise, the pattern here is very clear. The racial othering of individuals comes when they are not from a European or North American heritage. European and North American heritage um, brings in a stronger level of acceptance. This is reflecting the racial uh, formation of the United States right now. Who do we accept? Who do we reject? Who do we consider to be us? Who do we consider to be them?